welcome to Band Movie Beatdown. Today I break the hearts of many Johnny Depp fangirls by reviewing The Tourist. The Tourist is a 2010 thriller starring Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie. The film is meant to be an attempt to recapture the style of 60s thrillers like Charade, which are witty, sophisticated thrillers with ingenious twists and suspense. Indeed, the film is actually a remake of a 2005 French film called Anthony Zimmer, although this English language version changes the nationality from French to British. The script was intended for Tom Cruise, who turned it down to do the equally poor Night and Day, with Depp taking his place. No doubt due to the fact it would be a quick shoot in scenic Venice, which Jolie admitted was the only reason she signed on. Because that's a great reason for a movie to be made, isn't it? The director is Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, whose name I'm no doubt mispronouncing, and he was the director of the excellent German language thriller The Lives of Others. He also had a hand in the screenplay, along with acclaimed writer Julian Fellows. The result proves that even if you serve dog shit as a gourmet meal, it's still dog shit we have to swallow. So our film starts in Paris, where a surveillance team is monitoring their target, which is, of course, Elise, played by Angelina Jolie, who they less than subtly follow. Guys, a big grey van with a camera following ten foot behind the target is not exactly discreet. Shame they didn't pass that memo on to the filmmakers before their gratuitous Jolie butt shot. So Elise goes to her usual cafe and orders exactly the same thing she always does, with the impossibly discreet van parked right across the street. On a un visuel. Elle boit son thé. Quoi, répète Elle boit son thé. Vous m'avez demandé un thé, monsieur Ah non, non, merci. Do you want to say that again? I don't think she knows you're obviously following her yet. A courier arrives at the cafe, handing a letter to Elise. The French undercover team alert their counterparts in Scotland Yard, who are heading up the investigation, led by Atchison, played by Paul Bettany. They're after a man named Alexander Pierce, who has committed financial fraud and has recently undergone plastic surgery, so no one knows what he looks like. Elise opens the letter sent by Pierce. I know the police are watching you. We have to throw them off the trail. Board the 822 at the Gare de Lyon, pick someone my height and build, and make them believe it is me. So she has to find someone who looks like Pierce, who has recently had plastic surgery, so no one knows what he looks like. Gee, could you make your twist any more obvious, guys? We're only five minutes in! Oh, and Jolie reading out the letter in her voice only makes it more obvious that there's a twist. Alexander tells her to destroy the letter, which she complies with. The undercover team try to save the letter before it is destroyed, but a waiter dashes that hope. As Elise walks away, she passes a character known as the Englishman, played by Rufus Zewell. Or as I like to call him, painfully obvious red herring. The surveillance team desperately try to keep up with her. Is it really that hard to keep up with a woman walking? Hell, even Jolie's walking looks fake, like someone told her to act sexy. That and the huge amount of makeup on her make her look like one of those fucking terrifying puppets from the Diet Coke adverts. Ah, those things freak me the hell out. Ugh. For goodness sake, guys, why are you standing around in front of her? If you want to grab her, grab her. It's not like you're keeping your cover. She's evading three men in heels, for goodness sake. Worst surveillance team ever. So Elise gets away, and the whole operation is a complete tits-up, which results in Atchison being bollocked by his boss, played by Timothy Dalton. Most films can be improved by having Timothy Dalton in them. Sadly, there is enough Timothy Dalton in this one. So via some complete BS, they manage to scan in the burnt letter, and despite it being a random assortment of letters, Atchison manages to decode the key clue to Elise's location in a mere two minutes! That letter was burnt to a crisp! Paul Bessney could work for Tom Cruise and Minority Report with those skills! Board the 822 at the Gare de Lyon. Pick someone my height and build, and make them believe it is me. You know, guys, a sophisticated audience has more of an attention span than five minutes. You don't need to remind them already. So Elise scopes the train looking for candidates settling on an ordinary guy, played by Johnny Depp. I'm Elise. I'm Frank. That's a terrible name. <laughs> it's the only one I've got. Maybe we can find you another. How we have the word twist written in 30 foot neon lights. You're being so subtle. You mind me smoking? It's not a real cigarette, it's electronic. It delivers the same amount of nicotine, but the smoke is water vapor. Yeah, water. 
delight. Gee, I wonder if the twist will be indicated by him swapping the electronic cigarette for a real one. It's like looking at a watch with the mechanism exposed. Oh, and he's subtly positioned as a rebel because Depp's Frank is sat right underneath a no smoking sign. Oh, and he reads spy novels. I think you should have all guessed what the twist is. Congratulations, you're all very smart. Unfortunately, this is only 15 minutes in. Musician. Bartender. Thank you, ma'am. Teach my house. I would not have guessed that. I'd imagine you're the cool math teacher, though. Still a math teacher. Johnny Depp is a boring, plain math teacher. Johnny, two times sexiest man alive, Depp. I'm not buying it, movie. This is a major miscast. No offense to Johnny Depp, but if there's one thing he doesn't do, it's normal. The undercover operatives on the train take a picture of Frank and send it to Atchison. Could this be Pierce? I only have the sketches to go by, so it could be him. No one has a picture of this guy! Oh right, it would spoil the twist right from the start. Not that they haven't done that already. Scotland Yard aren't the only ones interested in Pierce, however, as a mole lets Reginald Shaw, the man who Pierce stole money from, played by Stephen Burkhoff, know that Alexander is in Venice. In Venice, Frank and Elise encounter each other again as she takes him to a hotel room, claiming that Frank is her husband. Oh, and the Englishman just happens to be there as well, doing his red herring duties. This part of the movie feels like a bloody advert for the Venetian tourist board, from the lavishly furnished beautiful hotel rooms to the sweeping scenery shots of Venice itself with classy, elegant music playing in the background. Oh, and get used to this because the plot stops for 20 minutes so we can stare at it until we're bored out of our minds. Come to Venice, a city of culture and romance. Marvel at the city famously built on water. Take a candlelit dinner by the river with a mysterious stranger. Ordering meals so fine even the waiters think you're a posh prat. Scampi and champagne risotto, please. Excellent choice. Relax in an incredibly expensive, lovingly furnished hotel room you've never afforded a million years. And maybe, maybe you can be just like Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie. No, of course not, you potbelly boob. So visit Venice and think amore. And I have no doubt that dozens of cappuccino slurping socialites pick their holiday destination purely based on this film. The pretentiousness radiates from the screen. It's the, um, the Roman god, Janus. My mother gave it to me when I was little. She wanted it to teach me that people have two sides. A good side, a bad side. We must embrace both in someone we love. A person with two faces? Just like a hidden identity? That's just like Johnny! Oh, sorry. Mustn't spoil the surprise! The big problem with these so-called romantic scenes between Depp and Jolie is a simple one. They don't mix. They may be two global sex symbols, but that can't disguise the fact they have no chemistry, and it turns the film into cold tedium when it should be simmering with sex appeal. May I pay you a compliment? Another question you need never ask. You are the least down-to-earth person I've ever met. Wow, that was delivered with all the conviction of a man about to fall asleep. They look so bored, as if making a movie was the last thing on their minds, and I'm almost certain it was. Of course, Elise is probably only pretending to be flattered by this cold fish because she's aware that she's being watched, and she kisses Frank, cementing the concept that he has pierced assures men that are watching them. And to really hammer this home, there's cross-cutting between Elise doing a sexy undressing for bed scene and Frank having a decidedly unerotic one. Ew, not socks! This is film symbolism 101 for crying out loud! After a dream sequence put into the movie purely so they can put it in the trailers, Frank wakes up the next morning to find that breakfast is being delivered to him and Elise has already left. Luckily, at nearly 40 minutes in, the plot finally kicks back into gear as Shaw's men come to the hotel room trying to capture Frank. Hello? Buongiorno, signore. Buongiorno. I, I need help. There are two men trying to break down the door. What kind of problem do you have with the door, sir? No, no, no. There are two men with guns trying to break in. I gotta go! Uh, 
Americani. Oh, you Americans, always getting shot at all the time. A decidedly tepid foot chase across the roofs of Venice occurs, and because the movie isn't quite sure where to play it for thrills or laughs, it succeeds at neither. <laughs> Brilliant editing there, it's almost like he didn't land in that fruit stand. The police capture him and place him under arrest, taking him to the station where he is questioned. You wish to report a murder? No. Some people tried to kill me. I was told you were reporting a murder. Attempted murder. That's not so serious. N no, not when you downgraded from murder. When you upgraded from room service, it's quite serious. The police think attempted murder is not so serious? You can see they're trying so hard to be funny and failing! The policeman doesn't believe him at first, but then suddenly takes him out of prison in the middle of the night when it checks out. This doesn't seem suspicious at all! The man you're talking about is called Alexander Pierce. He stole big money from a gangster. They think you are him. They place a, how do you say a bounty on your head. That's why you're not safe. Thanks, officer, for the expository dialogue. I sure hope you don't betray me for the bounty now. Well, surprise, surprise, that's exactly what happens because every plot development can be seen from 30 miles away. Luckily for Frank, Elise arrives to help him, connecting their two speedboats to try and escape. Slowly. Shaw's gangsters try to stop them, and again, it's another action scene without any thrills because it's so painfully slow, even with people getting hit by boats with bad CGI. The action is just as bad as the romance. Still, the budget must have been tight. A hundred million? This movie cost a hundred million dollars to make, and their action sequences look that pathetic? Will they blow their money on hotels? Or maybe it's because the script is so obvious at every turn that we know they'll escape with ease, and they do. Take this scene where Shaw's boys return having failed their mission. Their boss is being fitted for a suit. You do the mathematics on what's about to happen next. <coughs> and let me guess, he'll flippantly go back to looking at his suit. Yes. I think it looks all right. This villain is so painfully stock and cliche, right down to the fact that Stephen Burkoff is playing him. At least in Steel, he had that ridiculous looking accent I could take the piss out of. The following morning, Elise takes Frank to the airport and leaves him there, telling him to go back to America. Cue a moping montage and sad music. But I'm in love with you. No, stop, Elise. I love you. You're so exciting and adventurous. Elise rides back into Venice, where we discover, in a mildly surprising development, she's been working undercover for Atchison. You're ready to give me Pierce. Well, that's interesting. So you aren't here to beg me to lift your suspension. We live with a man for an entire year, during which time we don't get one single usable photograph. A whole year, and she didn't give you one photograph of Pierce? 365 days and nothing? And no one thought that was suspicious? At all? I mean, seriously, you are really stretching this movie. Elise reveals that she's going to meet Pierce at a ball. Meanwhile... That's right, smoking is so cool and sophisticated, it's the cancer that makes it so respectable. <laughs> Wearing a wire, Elise goes to the ball. Where have you been? I thought you'd never get here. How could you be so sure I was coming? Fate wouldn't bring me to an evening like this with no reason. No? No. Italian star Raul Bova in a pointless cameo appearance. I loved you in Alien vs Predator! And speaking of painful transparent red herrings, the Englishman is also at the ball, dropping Elise another letter from Alexander. She follows the Englishman, only to bump right into Frank. Cue the dance number! Yes, this is Frank on his flip side, or as I like to put it more bluntly, Johnny Depp with the charm turned on. I've been thinking about your friend Pierce and his plan, and so far, I'm thinking it hasn't worked out for him. Take that gangster guy. Sure. Yeah, I don't believe that Pierce was prepared for him being here for the whole chase. Shh! You're pointing out the plot holes! Elise detaches herself from him. Frank goes to follow, but Atchison's men attack him and capture him. Elise opens the letter to find a key and an address, and she and Atchison make their way to it. Who are you people? 
Where are we going? Well, I don't know, Alexander. Where are we going? I'm not Alexander. My name is Frank Tupelo. I don't care what you call yourself these days. Your name is Alexander Pierce, and you have no rights. <laughs> I know you're not Alexander Pierce, but you know who you are? You're a moron. Wouldn't it be funny if his character was wrong, just like every other time in this film? Elise goes to the location, but Sean and his men have followed her and captured her. You know, in our quaint legal system, if a man sleeps with my wife, I kill him and her, I get away scot-free. Crime of passion is what it's called, but my passion extends to all the things I own. They are me. For he has taken from me something for which I have paid the infinite price. My soul. <laughs> That's something these idiots will never understand. What the hell are you even talking about? Stop pretending like you aren't some evil cardboard villain. You never had a soul. You were never written to have one. There. Yes, it's behind the giant symbolic symbol. Atchison has snipers pointed at the apartment and is watching the situation. The snipers want to open fire, but Atchison keeps calling them off, much to Frank's dismay. There is movement in the courtyard. Pierce, I knew it. You know what? He does look a little like you. No! Oh, for crying out loud, how did he manage to escape the boat with no one seeing or hearing it in the process? Elise is being forced to open the safe, but she doesn't know the combination. That's when Frank walks in. Who the hell are you? I'm Alexander Pierce. Alexander, is it you? Truly. You sound different. Voice chip implant. No, no, I mean the way you speak. Yes, that's right. Alexander was English. This man is American. I've actually gotten so used to the American accent that I find it a tad difficult to go back. Johnny, that's a pirate, not an English accent. You're not playing Jack Sparrow. And so we get the whole, is he, isn't he scenario, which might hold some tension had it not been blatantly obvious from the very beginning. We know he's Pierce, the movie wouldn't make sense otherwise, so stop playing around and get on with it. Frank is forced to open the safe by Shaw as Atchison hesitates, still thinking that Alexander hasn't arrived yet. Yeah, come for her, it doesn't make sense. This is Chief Inspector Jones, permission granted. Fire. How nice of you to show up again, Timothy. Where have you been for the last 80 minutes or so? And how did he get here? Deus Ex Machina much? So the snipers take out Sean and his men, leaving Frank and Elise standing. Jones and Atchison make sure they're okay, with Jones relieving Elise of her duties. They get a radio stating they found Alexander, only it's the Englishman. So what's the explanation for why he's been following them the entire time? This better be good. He said I might get arrested at some point. Who? The man has been sending me these texts. Texts? And the money, of course. So let me get this straight, because I'm, I'm a little confused. You receive money from a man you've never met before, who sends you text messages telling you just to show up somewhere. Ah, that's clever. You thought the tourist of the title was Frank, but it was actually him all along. <laughs> no, that explanation was both incredibly lame and incredibly obvious. This movie in a nutshell. Back at the apartment, Frank opens the safe with the correct combination, proving that he is in fact Alexander Pierce. Like that was a surprise at all! And really his plan doesn't make any kind of sense. Let's break it down, shall we? So he spent years and money having extensive plastic surgery and reconfiguring himself so that no one could recognise him. He then invites Elite onto a train to lure the authorities to someone who looks like him, implicating himself? Was that the plan, to have Elise find him on the train? If it wasn't, then he shouldn't be sat on the bloody thing in the first place! Why does Alexander have this man follow her when he doesn't do anything else besides follow? Surely he would want Elise to implicate this man as being him! It would certainly give him more to do than just be a pointless red herring throughout the entire movie. And if it was all just a scheme to get back with Elise, why did he do it this way, which would risk capture and death? He may not have known about the gangsters, but surely he'd know they would end up being involved. And why did he remain in character as Frank, even when it was just between them two? That might have saved a hell of a lot of confusion! The plot doesn't make any kind of sense! The film is built on a plot whirlpool! The authorities realise they were duped and blow open the safe, revealing a cheque for the money owed. This operation is now officially terminated. Sir, listen, we have our money, Atchison. But we don't have Pierce. But what is it he did? He 
He stole money from a gangster, a dead gangster, and he has good taste in women. I can't say I don't wish him well. So is Pierce meant to be some sort of lovable rogue now, or is this the movie just throwing up its hands and giving up? Twenty million dollars worth of plastic surgery. And that's the face you choose. Do not like it. It'll do. Hey, don't knock it. He was voted world's sexiest man. TWICE! So without any sort of satisfying resolution, the movie rolls credits. The tourist aims to be smart, sophisticated, and witty, and it fails at those three aims completely. The tourist fails because Depp and Jolie fail as a pairing. If they had a spark between them, the flaws wouldn't be so glaringly apparent, although it might also be because they turn in lazy, uninterested performances. Jolie spends the whole movie acting sexy, and Depp is completely lost in a part that miscasts him as someone who is meant to be normal. The plot simply doesn't make sense when it isn't being tremendously formulaic, built around a poorly concealed twist that doesn't even hold up to the slightest bit of scrutiny. The direction is poor and slow, making it awfully dull. The comedy isn't funny, the action is limited, and the romance doesn't spark, meaning it fails just all around. Oh, and there's not enough Timothy Dalton! I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere. Maybe I need a trip to Italy. two global sex symbols, but they can't disguise the fact they have no chemistry together, and it turns the film into cold tedium when it should be simmering with sex appeal. That looked rather pervy. SIMMERING! Oh, oh. Okay, um, that was embarrassing. <laughs>